Hello, I'm Nick McSpadden. Uh, I work at a school in San Francisco, and since I have a lot of spare time, I get to play with a lot of really fun toys. And the fun toy I'm going to talk about today is Docker. If you've never heard of Docker, it's worth Googling. There's a whole community behind it. Docker is actually a startup in San Francisco that is developing a system of making containers for various services, these little tiny containers, and we'll talk about what that means. The idea behind Docker is that you can take any individual app or service and run it inside its own little tiny sandbox. It's a very tiny Linux sandbox in a minimal environment. And you can take this little tiny sandbox, this little tiny container, and you can move it to different places. You can do different things with it. Docker containers can talk to each other. Containers can work on any platform. They can be scaled. They can be managed through distributed clustering systems. The idea behind a single container is that for any given service or app that you run, such as a monkey server, for example, can fit into a single container. And so each one of your services is sandboxed off into these separate containers. And when you combine all these Docker containers together, you can come up with a really nice Mac administration toolbox. The idea behind a container is that it's thinner than just running a VM. These are all straight from the Docker website. I don't get credit for this. I just get credit for theft. Um, so a virtual machine, right, when you spin up a virtual machine, you've got your base OS, all the overhead from running this operating system, the VM tools, things like that, plus your services in on that. So spinning up a new VM for each individual service or app you want, that's what we've been doing for a really long time. We're all kind of used to that. But in some cases, for really small, tight, you know, lightweight services, that may just not be appropriate. Um, Docker containers have the advantage of sharing the guest OS and only having to use the parts that, differ that are differentiated for each individual service. The Docker registry has a whole lot of content already up there. Just about any popular service you can think of, they've already developed Dockerized containers for this sort of thing. So if you want to run your own WordPress instance, databases, web servers, there are already containers in place that you can use. All you have to do is provide the content. These services and the tools within them are already pre-designed for you. It's sort of like a prefabricated system. Containers are actually really straightforward. Okay, they're based on Docker files, which are simple sets of instructions for what you what you start with, your base layer, then you just add stuff onto it. So um, here's a simple monkey container. You start with nginx, which is a very nice lightweight web server. All you got to do, add a few directories, add some configuration files, open a port, make a volume, and you've got a container that runs your monkey service. Now, right now, you're probably all thinking, this is Linux. This is a Mac conference. What are we talking about here? And so the idea behind this is, it's very absurd, I know. <laughs> the idea behind this is that you can use these cross-platform tools to manage things that have previously been limited to Mac only. For a long time, Mac management has been kind of attached and tethered to Mac OS X server in a lot of ways. We've been stuck trying to convince the network admins, we really do want to put this Mac Mini in the data center. It'll be fine. Trust me, it'll be fine. Don't look at me like that. Why are you looking at me like that? And then you know we get into fights, there's hurt feelings. We don't like having that problem. So all these services that we've been sort of depending on from OS X server alone, we're finally getting to the point where we can actually finally migrate away from this reliance. We can finally move away from depending upon OS X server itself as the way to get what we need. Net install web services, mail services. Most people don't use OS X server as their primary web server, or their primary mail server, or their primary DNS server. Most people who come from any kind of enterprise scale already have solutions in place that are designed to handle large scale approaches like that. So having OS X server do this for us is kind of unnecessary. But what do we have to work with OS X server on? Well, we need net install service for Deploy Studio. Anybody who uses that has to rely on net booting. There's other services that OS X server provides that are kind of on the unique side, but not necessarily. The point is that we can now move away from OS X server as the way to manage our Mac tools. We now have sufficient equivalent replacements that are cross-platform. And with anything that can run cross-platform, if you can do it in Linux, you can do it in Docker. <laughs> And so the idea here is to introduce Docker as a Mac management toolbox. So first off, if you're on OS X, which given the number of Apple logos I'm seeing glaring at me right here, a lot of us is you know, important to us. So Kitematic is a very nice visual application for managing Docker. They finally developed a pretty nice GUI for it. It looks kind of pretty. I'll show you a little bit of a demo of it in a little bit. 
Um, it's a great way to just sort of pull images off the Docker registry, your own images or public images, and just sort of get them started and play with it a little bit. There's also uh, a way to what's called boot to Docker, which the basic idea behind this is that because Docker is a Linux tool, it runs a very, very tiny Linux virtual machine in between you and your Docker parts. And, and all the Docker containers inside your Linux, your Linux virtual machine are sort of abstracted through that layer for you. So all you ever see is the output of your Docker containers. The fact that it's running on Linux is kind of unimportant to you. So let's talk about some Mac management tools. I'm sure a lot of these are familiar to everybody here. Puppet, Reposado, Monkey, right? These are all tools that we're all pretty much using in production right now. And so we're going to sort of talk about how this is all going to fit together. You've got your basic OS X client. It has to check in with Monkey to get its software. You have to also check in with Reposado to get your local software updates. You might want to also have Monkey send reporting data to Sal, which if you're not familiar with is a reporting engine for Monkey. You might want to use Puppet to help configure your Macs or to manage your monkey settings. Um, and then, of course, Sal has a dependency on a Postgres database. So you've got already, you've got a couple different pieces fitting into your Mac management tool set. Normally, what we've done before is we've you know, set up separate VMs or we've made one big master Mac management VM and have all these things that we had to install separately. That's a lot of work. One of the advantages of Docker is that each one of these little boxes, which I spent a lot of time making in Keynote with nice fancy colors, these all represent individual things you're just linking together. So we looked at a monkey configuration before, a Docker file for monkey before, and the idea is pretty straightforward. You have Nginx, which is just the web server. You open up a port, port 80 for web service, and you have a volume that is used to share to other containers. This volume, which you really can't see in the lights here, I'm sorry about that. This volume is just where your monkey repo data is actually stored, right? So any, you know, the monkey is just, monkey is just a web server, and the web server contains a few folders that has the data you need inside of it. And we're going to share this out to other volumes, and you'll see how that makes a difference. This Docker file represents this picture, if you want a little bit more clarification on that. I'm going to run through this in a demo. I'm going, show, I'm, going to, I'm going to show this in a demo rather than just necessarily talking about it. But the idea is that we have two parts of our containers that we want to use, data and actual production service. The data container is a special way of using a Docker container just to store content. We're going to keep our monkey repo content, the manifests, the catalogs, the icons, the package infos, the packages, sitting inside this data container. This data container is never going to run. It's just sitting there to hold your data. The monkey container is going, to, is going to look inside this data container to find its data, pull it out, and actually serve it to you. The cool thing about using containers in a way like this is that if you take away the monkey container and you spin up a new one, or you just move it to a different server and you want to make a new one show up, the monkey data container is what actually contains your repo. You're not going to lose any data by stopping and starting your monkey container. So the idea of keeping these services separate, you've got separate sandboxes. You can take away these containers in bits and pieces, and the whole foundation is there. Think of it as you're building a house. You can take away the cornerstone. The house will still stand and put a new one in, and it will still be just fine. See, the idea is that you can remove any part of the sandbox construction, and your sandcastle is still there. If you remove all of them, of course, you lose your data. OK, so we're going to populate an example monkey repo using a very simple Saba container, an SMB container, to access our monkey repo from the finder. And I'll, I'll, dem I'll demonstrate this, I promise. I'm not just going to talk about it. We will run a Samba container, access it through standard SMB port you know, 445, put our content in it, and then it's going to show up. And I'm going to go ahead and do that right now, actually. I'm going to take a break from this going to move my terminal window over. And I'm going to do a whole lot of copying and pasting. In case you were, well, I'll show you first. OK. Yes, I can. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah, it does not like doing full screen. All right, I'm going to turn display mirroring on because the overscan is not making it work. Okay. Oops, wrong window. Is this, uh, can everybody see the text clearly there? Okay. <laughs> that might be too much. Is that clear enough? Yeah. Okay. Groovy. All right. This is Kitematic. Kitematic, a very nice little GUI for Docker, lets you pull things from the registry, lets you start and stop things, and lets you look at your containers on a very serious, deep level. And so looking at these containers right here, all right, we're looking at the monkey container. Here's the important thing. The monkey container has two ports open, 80 and 443. 80 is obvious. We need web servers. Uh, 443, if we ever decide to turn on HTTPS for our monkey repo, that will become relevant for this demo. We're not going to do that. What you see here, this is where the abstraction kicks in. <laughs> Because this is running a very tiny Linux virtual machine with its own tiny private network, what actually is happening is that this IP address, 192.168.99.100, is actually the IP address of the VM that's running the Docker container. And if I go to that right now, right, there's no content. This is an empty monkey repo. There's nothing here right now. So we've got to fill it with something. So let's go ahead and run our SMB container. Going to make a few little changes here, a few little changes there. Okay, and now if you look in Kitematic, I've got three containers going. My data container, which is not running, my monkey container, which is running, and an SMB container, which does one thing and one thing only. It takes the shared volume, monkey repo, from my data container, and it allows me to access it by doing this. Now, obviously in production, you wouldn't just want to have this publicly writable from anybody on guest. That's a terrible idea. Don't do that. But now, I can go ahead and make my monkey repo. Fantastic. OK. Now, I've got an empty monkey repo. I want to fill this with stuff. Let's use manifest util for the pretty much first time anybody will ever use this. Okay. Good enough for now. I'm going to have a manifest in here, site default. If I actually navigate to that, there it is. There's a file I just created just through SMB mounting, right? So that's just a simple empty manifest right now. So now let's populate it with data. The greatest way to populate monkey with data, of course, is auto package, a very handy way of getting stuff done. We'll just use VLC as an example. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to set up VLC in monkey to install on my machine. And just to show you that I'm not cheating, this is my applications folder. There is no VLC in my applications folder. That will change. This will run yeah. for a while. Yeah. It's already downloaded, but you know. It's, so on a production system, you obviously wouldn't want to have your own way of accessing your repo through a Linux abstracted sandbox, because right now it's copying files into a VM through SMB into a Docker container, which takes forever. It's really slow. I'm sorry about that. But what's happening here is that uh, through Kitematic, you can sort of take a look at what kind of what's going on. The log window is really tiny on this screen, and I apologize for that. But all of these containers give you an idea of what's going on here. And so we're taking this data. Copy so when auto package runs, it's going to take the file it downloads, VLC, copy it into the monkey repo for us. And you're going to see that right here. There it goes. Things that work. Yay. We like when things work. All right? So we've got VLC in our monkey repo. Let's go ahead and actually 
add that to our site default repo. If you look at it now, you'll see that VLC is there, which means that any monkey client that connects to this monkey repository is just going to have VLC downloaded on it. Uh -oh. oh, I found the problem. The IP address changed. So what I did here to configure my client is I actually installed this little profile that just tells it, use the repo URL of the monkey Docker container. Don't install Apple software updates, because that's bad right now. You don't want to do that during your presentation. That's just asking for fire. Actually, you could just copy and paste this. Right row. It does not like me right now. That makes me sad. That is correct. It should just do that anyway. Whoa. Site default. There we go. All right, that looks better. Now. Oh, I didn't add a catalog to the manifest. That's my problem. This is what happens when you don't use manifest util properly. OK. Now we're on the trolley. Yay. Only one failure in my demo today. This is an improvement. Yeah. All right, so there we go. It's saying, hey. I found VLC for your client. You want to go ahead and install it? OK, let's go ahead and install it. Whoops. Wait for it. I know the hype is killing everybody. I can just tell. <laughs> You have no idea how exciting this is, just watching the bits fly. So what's, what's happening here, all right, to sum up again, I've got a little tiny sandbox running monkey. This sandbox running monkey is based on another tiny sandbox, which contains the actual content of this monkey repo. This stuff here is all inside monkey data. The monkey container says, hey, give me the contents of this folder. I want to serve it to clients through Nginx. To access this folder on my, client, my workstation here, what I'm doing is using an SMB container. This SMB container says, give me a folder, in this case, the monkey repository folder, share it out through SMB. I connected to that in the finder through SMB, filled in my content, and I demonstrated that it works on my client. So there you go. You've got your own simple setup for a Docker setup that will get Monkey going on your client machines. Now, you can take this Docker container, you can take your data container, you can take your SMB container, you can ship all these up to any other that's running Docker that you want. They're portable containers. The idea behind this container system is that you can spin up any number of these without adding additional costs. You can cluster and distribute this across any number of servers, as long as you have the tools to manage to do so. Uh, if you ever want to see some crazy clustering, Look into Google's Kubernetes program. It's, it's bananas, I swear. This is what they use to manage all of their Docker containers distributed across their massive infrastructure. I mean, we're talking, OK, I need the entire west coast of this country to spin up a container. Yeah, so I work at a K-12 school. Not exactly a big priority for me to worry about clustering. That being said,
do, 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 do. Oh, come on. I got bit hard by the demo today. It's brutal. My machine is locked up. There we go. Keynote crashed. Yay. All right. And part of the problem is because I'm running Docker containers on a really tiny machine. I need to stop this before my machine explodes. Yeah, a MacBook Air with four gigs of RAM, not a great Docker host. <laughs> Let me suffer so that you don't have to. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, so, again, Monkey is just an Nginx web server. Monkey data has my content. So the SMV container is how I access it on my client uh, for, fulfill for actually putting stuff into it. And then, of course, I just run Monkey on the client to actually get the, get the stuff there. And it works. Okay, and then we use Auto Package, of course. And Auto Package, all I had to do to get Auto Package to work Wow, you cannot see black on green on that, can you? Woof. All I had to do to get auto package to work is just you know, configure the auto package monkey repo uh, single preference there to say, hey, my repo is being mounted at volumes public from this container. Add the manifests. And then, as we saw, it worked. All I had to do at that point, either install a profile or use defaults to write the IP address of your monkey Docker container to your preferences so that monkey can actually access it. And then it works. I now have VLC installed on my machine. So you can go from here to a lot of different directions. The idea is that if you want to add on an Apple software update server, you want to run Reposado on top of your, uh, on top of your setup as well, guess what? There's a container for that too. The Mac admin community has helpfully provided containers for almost everything here. Here's a Reposado container. If you want to add Sal to the mix, here's a Sal container. If you want to add more puppet configurations, you want to add net booting services through BSDP, or sorry, BSDPY, which is uh, Papine Brienne's very, very wonderfully designed uh, Python based net boot server. All these services exist in Docker containers. These are all publicly available right now on the Docker registry. You can even run Casper. I tried it. It works. It's not, it's not great. I mean, and it's also Casper. Ooh, was that too soon? Ouch. <laughs> One of the fun things you can do with containers is that they have this amazing trick where you can link a bunch of containers together. We saw this already with Monkey and Monkey Data and SMB. They link the containers together by using these certain access pathways that we provide. We say, Monkey, use the folder from data. SMV, use a folder from data. Sal, use the content from monkey data. With these links, you can actually do some pretty impressive tricks. For example, this is my blog. I'm just going to go ahead and plug myself. No shame. You can use Puppet in a container. Use your Puppet server in a container to provide certs for all of your clients. Link that container to Monkey. Give Monkey your client certs. You now have certificate-based authentication from your Monkey clients to your Monkey server in a very few number of steps, right? It doesn't take very much work to get this set up. Setting up a Puppet server, not really a trivial thing. Setting up Sal, in many cases, not really a trivial thing, because it's Django-based. You've got to set up WSGI. It's you know, Python. Like, setting up Django is, you know, anybody who's done it, it's, it's a fair amount of work. Setting up all these different services individually, it takes a lot of work. Or you find a container on the registry of somebody who's done it for you. You download the container and you run it, and the service is done. The idea behind using these Docker containers is to simplify some of these complicated processes of setting up these Mac management tools into simple ways of just start and stop. One of the benefits to OS 10 server, okay, look at the caching server. What do you do with the caching server? You turn it on, and it just works, right? That's Apple's whole thing with OS 10 server. You turn it on, it just works. Now, we all know that in cases like mail server, turning it on and it just works doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, web servers, obviously, we want to have a little more fine-tuned control. And so in many cases, those things are things that we leave to the industrial strength 
uh, enterprise skills that we have. But for these tools here, if you just want to get this working, if you just want to get it simply up and running and be able to work on any platform of your choice, Docker is a great way to approach these problems because people have solved these problems for you. All you got to do is just follow the steps. So one of my goals as an admin is to try and make this process as easy as you can get to get all these going. And so theoretically, you could have one simple Docker VM that's running your entire Mac management infrastructure, NetBoot, Imager, Monkey, Reposado, Sal, one-stop shop. And if that Docker, ho that Docker host can then be shared out to other servers running Docker, you could have your entire international distribution of servers running the same set of Docker configurations. And it's the same tool on each one of them. It's black magic. Do we have any questions at the moment? Yes. Sure. So, you know, again, running services depends on the resource. So the question was, what's the capacity like of a single Linux server running the Docker, running, running the Docker host, managing all these services for you? And the answer to that is the same sort of rules apply with Docker, without Docker. When you start adding more and more services to a single host, that host obviously has to come up with more ability to serve multiple things at once. CPU requirements increase, RAM requirements increase. It all depends on the services you're running. Oh, I see. What's the overhead of Docker itself? Uh, minimal compared to running separate VMs for all these things. So one of the major comparisons that you're often going to see is running this with Docker, running this without Docker. So if you run these without Docker, right, you have, so let's say you want to set up your web server to serve out Monkey, Reposado, and Sal all at the same time. So that requires, let's say, some Apache tuning or some NGNX tuning. That's going to require to set up virtual hosts and things like that. Um, that you know, the overhead of that is low because there's, no, there's nothing in between you and the native running service, but the work it takes to get those set up is, I think, is more so than simply just setting up a container with the appropriate links. And so the actual Docker layer doesn't provide that much of a significant increase in overhead at all. Um, I don't have metrics on that. I really don't. Uh, I'm positive there are people out there who do, who spend their entire jobs making sure that these numbers match up. And so I'm sure with some effort, we could probably find some information about specifically what kind of a difference it makes. In my testing, it hasn't made any difference at all. But again, I'm a K-12 school. So take that with a grain of salt. Thank you. Um, this is somewhat related to what Luis, Luis was saying. So with regards to resource allocation, what level of visibility or tools do you know of or have with regards to providing insight into the resource utilization allocation if there is even control of resource allocation on a per container basis? On a per container basis? I haven't, honest, I'll be honest, I haven't looked into it too much, like limiting specific containers to specific amounts of resources. Um, I would generally say that for best performance, you really want to tune the server that Docker is running on to be able to accommodate the services you want to run. So just like as if you want to run a big web server to handle 10,000 clients, you should assume that your Docker server should have that whether it's running Docker or not. And so on a per app basis, the ability to limit individual containers to specific resource allocations, uh, I just don't know. What I can say in terms of one of the advantages that Docker offers is that, uh, which I, may, I don't think I've said before, each container that I'm running right here, whoops, okay, these containers that I'm running, and this is formatted terribly when you zoom in a lot, monkey and SMB, okay, I can run a hundred of these monkey containers. It requires zero added disk space. The only time disk space is used is when you write files to the disk. You can run same container a hundred times without increasing the cost in terms of storage. Now, obviously, if you have a hundred containers that are serving out content, the increased CPU and RAM costs do add up. And, you know, like I said, you should make sure that your VM is capable of handling the scale that you're trying to serve it at. But the idea behind the containers is that they share the same layers. Docker is built on a series of layers of pieces. And if you're running the same exact container over and over again, it has to make no new content to access the data that it wants. It just builds the layers on top of each other modularly. 
kind of like thin imaging. And so uh, when it comes to allocating individual resources, I don't have necessarily have a need to say this monkey container gets more than that monkey container. I just trust, I just trust that the allocation of resources for the VM will be sufficient to handle the scale that I need. Right. You talked about briefly that there was uh, some overhead involved. Um, so can you make some sort of uh, statistical comparison with regards to running a, a containerized environment versus bare metal? Like what's the, what's the hit? What's the performance hit? Well, okay, so even if you're running bare metal, you still have to have an OS in there, right? So if you're going to have an OS in there, so this, you know, the example from Docker's web page, right? If you're going to have an OS in there, you're going to have your hypervisor installed. You've got to have all your things running inside there somewhere. And so with Docker, you kind of take away part of that by having one VM be your Docker host, and then all the services you run off of that have almost no overhead within that one VM. So think about it this way. I'm from a K-12 school. Unlike people here who have money that grows on trees and Mac Pros that fall from the sky, I don't have unlimited virtual machines. Some people here, <clears throat> Dropbox, can just make up virtual machines for pretty much whatever they want, anytime they want. I don't have that luxury. So for me, Docker makes sense because I really only have a few VMs on our limited VM host to manage the services that I want. And now I've got one simple source that has all the different pieces I want to assemble for my Mac management tool set. And there's almost no overhead running them on this one VM, as opposed to installing all of them natively or setting up more and more VMs for each of these additional services they want to add on. With, this, with this, this construction approach using basically Lego blocks, I can make a really cool Lego structure, a nice little big Lego tower to run all my Mac tools, as opposed to having to get out separate, you know, separate VMs each time I want to do that. So if resource limitation is an issue for you, Docker kind of makes sense as an approach. If you have unlimited resources, Docker may not necessarily be the solution that you need. I still think that the workflow for getting new services set up for Docker simplifies it enough that it makes it worthwhile to look at as an approach. Um, but if you're looking at actual metrics of tuning your services to handle the need that you've got, you really have to do some, you have to do some number crunching, honestly. And that, that, that comes down to you, your network team, and your, you know, your, your storage and your server managers to sort of look at what you want to get out of your machines. Um, Alistair. Don't ruin this for me, Alistair. <laughs> I'm going to end up on somebody's slide, aren't I? Um, the runtime constraints on resources on docs.docker.com has information on tuning that you can do to the VM, which you can't really do when you consider the host bare metal. Even when you have like an ESXi or other type of Zen or clustered infrastructure for your VMs, you don't really have a way to say, you know what, I'm going to tune this down or, or use it differently. Uh, well, you, you in more, I mean, in more complex environments or ESXi infrastructure, yet, yes, of course, you can decide you're going to reallocate some things, but not necessarily on the fly. Uh, this is something where you have a process model that, therefore, you can also have better resource utilization. A lot of times when these processes are running as idle, it's a little bit easier to kind of introspect them and say, okay, I don't need as much of this host for this Docker container. Um, Kubernetes, uh, as one way to pronounce it, uh, <laughs> for moving around Docker containers um, is a way to do that type of orchestration when you decide that you have an underutilized host. Uh, and the configuration advantage is also there. Pardon me for just droning on forever, but... Please. Um, the configuration uh, advantage is the fact that instead of like worrying about snapshotting an entire VM because you're about to make a change to a service, it's a Docker container with layers. You essentially are making a linked clone is possibly, you had said it's, it's like thin imaging where you're layering something on top of a base set. I kind of think of it as the, the VM uh, paradigm of a linked clone where you have this layer of where it's at right now that you're branching off from and it's easier to say only for this one service that happens to be running on the same physical or virtual host, am I going to take a snapshot in time, which just gets a hash, and then I'm going to make my changes to see whether or not they'll work, but I can just tear away that extra layer if, it, if things didn't work out and I'm rolling backwards. I'm actually being able to roll back. Um, so there's a bunch of advantages that different Environments may not be able to take advantage of or don't need when it comes to saying, okay, it's an underutilized host. I will 
add more containers to it. Maybe you don't have a services model that really fits with that. Um, but otherwise, you get these advantages that you would not have otherwise about thinking things very granularly per service. Right, so on that note, right, so I can take the existing monkey data repo that I have, or the monkey data container that I have right now, and as Alistair said, I can take that current existing container, branch off of that. I can use Docker commit to make a new container based off of that, ship that out to all my other servers that I need to run. So if I need to make replicas of my monkey repository across the board for a number of different services or a number of different servers or locations, it's really easy to do it with your existing containers. Take your current one, make a linked clone, as Alistair says. Pass it on. Things don't work out, roll back to your layers. Every single piece of Docker is built on a layering the functions that you need on top of it. And every time you start adding files to storage, it just builds more layers there. So you can sort of peel apart the pieces you do and don't want to get the kind of exact tuning that you need. And so with this sandbox approach, with this container approach, like I said, it's like a Lego tower. It's really easy to build the services that you want into one big model. Are those containers Yes. The idea behind Docker is that it's... The question was, are the containers platform agnostic? It's platform agnostic. The whole idea behind the Docker containers is that you can run this on anything that runs a Docker binary. And so, you know, Windows with boot to Docker, Mac with boot to Docker or Kitematic, Linux with Docker natively, you just take these containers, move them to anywhere, they'll just work across the board. So one of the reasons why I like using Docker as an approach is that if you've ever wanted to try out some of these services that you haven't really had a chance to put before, Docker makes it really, really easy to start and stop, right? It, it, it costs almost nothing to spin up another web server. It costs almost nothing to spin up another, you know, another, like a puppet server, play with it and say, all right, I'm done, didn't really work out, remove. How many of you would actually want to try installing puppet server natively on Linux, play with it and say, oh, this didn't work out, let's try uninstalling puppet? <laughs> well, okay, so Alistair's a masochist. Um, so, hello. <laughs> All right, number three, that's rough. <laughs> Skip. Thank you. Um, so um, Docker and underlying Lexi have just gone crazy. I think Docker's a public company or about to be or? Soon, probably. Yeah. yeah growing it's like just mad. massive. Um, but there's a lot of changes. So LexD uh, with, I guess, Go underpinnings is, uh, is coming out soon. And then Flocker was announced yesterday. Uh, any any thoughts or how this how you might evolve some of yeah, your yeah so uh, the the idea behind so okay I'm sort of talking about Docker on a very one to one level as in I've got one host I want to add these services let's make containers it's really cool most of the people who are looking at Docker are saying great you have one server I run twenty thousand across the world and I need to all go run the same thing and so for for a lot of the enterprise scale tools. Things like Flocker and you know other tools like that, are and, and Kubernetes, Kubernetes, however it's pronounced, I just really don't know. Um, all those are sort of designed to, to sort of metagame Docker a bit, as in we have small containers, that's one way of looking at it, but now let's look at the bigger picture. You want to run your big Lego set together? You want to be able to build the same Lego set every single time? Well, when you open up a Lego box, what do you get with it? The manual that has the pictures for how to assemble it, which of course you give it to your kids, they throw the manual out and build whatever they want, right? So same kind of approach here. Is that, okay, I need to build the exact same Lego set 20,000 times across the world, and I don't want to individually do that. So you use these tools to manage distribution, to manage load balancing, to automatically spin up and spin down containers on an enterprise level, on an international global level. That's what these tools are really for, is this distributed clustering approach. And, you know, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I'm a K-12 school. Clustering is not a problem that I have to worry about. But... For people of large scale, it's a huge deal. And it simplifies the approach quite a bit. Now, it's unlikely, I think, that many of us will need to spin up 20,000 instances of Sal or Monkey Webin or something like that. But if you've already got a Docker environment, you're already looking at containerization as a tool in your general system infrastructure, this is a great way to get your Mac management into the same framework as all your other server managements. You can get Chef in here, you can get Puppet in here, you can get pretty much anything you could imagine is somewhere on the Docker registry. Mm -hmm. Go, Internet. By the way, did, did you try Vagrant at all, or do you use it or try to integrate it? Yeah, I, I, so Vagrant solves a kind of a similar, a, a, sort of a similar approach, but it, I think it solves a problem a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't really use it personally. Uh, I think that given 
One of my issues that I have personally with Vagrant, and again, I don't have very much experience, so please, please apologize if I'm wrong about this, is that uh, I found a little bit harder for me to come up with the exact recipe for creating the Vagrant setup that I wanted and sharing it to everybody else so it would work the same way no matter what platform they used. Docker kind of abstracts that problem away, which is one of the reasons why I like using the Docker approach. Um, but the idea here is that you look at all these different containers that people have written, and this is going to work the same way every time. You, you can rely on this being the same Lego piece you buy no matter what set it comes in. And so you combine these pieces together to make your nice Lego tower, and it's just going to work out of the box. There's really no extra configuration required once you've got Docker in. So it's like once you, get in, once you step into the door, all the pieces are always going to fit together the same way. Millions of downloads. <laughs> yeah, as you can see, some of these are, are quite popular, right, for you know, Node and Ubuntu and all that. And so my suggestion would be you want to introduce a new service, look here first. You might be surprised at what you find out there. There's a question all the way in the back. <laughs> I love you, Michael Lynn. Take it away. Uh, so have you tried or played with the X-Hive at all or anything like that instead of using for, for doing native Docker, basically? Na you know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's uh, a lot so closer to the OS. The initial reports I've seen for X-Hive are that it's a little bit slower. It really? It is. It's slower. That's surprising. Uh, it will probably be a while before that catches up, and I expect that to change. Um, but right now, if you're looking for performance tuning, X-Hive is not the way to go. Uh, so there are a lot of ways to sort of approach the how do I minimize the impact of Docker even more? How do I get closer down to the bare metal as much as I can? And uh, all the different approaches out there have pros and cons. So far, I haven't seen, again, an in my environment, haven't seen a need for any of them yet. Probably never will. But a lot of people are working really hard on making those happen. And as was mentioned before, it's changing rapidly. We're going to see a lot of massive growth in this area. So I fully expect that we're going to see things like Flocker and XHive really take off and, and have major performance improvements in a really short span of time. Yeah, so for anyone not familiar with XHive, so the newer versions of OS 10 include a virtualization, a hypervisor framework. It's private. It's Well, it's not private, but it's just not documented. And people are starting to write minimal uh, VMs for it, basically. There was a DOS one that was the first one, and then uh, that now there's a minimal Linux one, which they now have a CoreOS Docker image that runs on it. So you could basically, without installing really any extra software other than this, uh, X Hive, basically, you could just start up uh, a Linux VM running in your. Uh, yeah, it'd be really exciting if we could actually start seeing a native Docker implementation for OS 10 without um, virtual box again, or whatever. It'll be a while, I think, before we get to that point. It'll be all for that before it really becomes worth it. A lot of that depends on Apple, and depending on Apple to fix undocumented private frameworks that no one else knows about <laughs> has always been a bit of a grab bag for us. So um, I wouldn't hold your breath on that one anytime soon. But uh, this new hypervisor framework in, in El Capitan is a super exciting to see the, the process that might come out of it. Sorry, how's X5 or X5 spelled? X-H-Y-V-E. Because, you know, why not? It's startup stuff. <laughs> we can't use real vowels. Anybody else have any questions? Chris, speak into the mic, or just walk up to him. <laughs> so, You're killing me. You're killing me. Do, we want, do you have a question? I have a real question. Volunteers can ask questions, too. Jeez. Um, do you have any come across any need to uh, have inter-process communication between stuff running in your different Docker containers? In what context? Uh, say you have something that's subscribed to a socket and you want to send a message to another thing that's yeah, listening. Yeah, so I kind of glossed over this because it's okay. basically black magic voodoo. But the idea, so let's see. Where is my, here we go. There's some magic you can do with Docker where you get to use things like volumes from, and you also get to use, uh, let's see, where's a good example? All right, here's a good example. I'm going to spin up a quick Postgres database. 
because that's just what one, one, what one does during a demo. All right, right here, I've now got a SAL database running. All right, so just in case, here's SAL running, uh, just, just like that. The idea is that this is the Docker magic you're asking about. This is the intercontainer communication system right here, this thing called link. Link just basically says, take some magical properties of this container, the Postgres SAL, call it DB, which means that inside this container, it can access any of the outward facing things from the database and refer to it by name of DB. So inside my Postgres SAL container, it sees a Postgres database just existing, out, floating out in the ether, just called DB. So when it says, let's go to DB port, oh, what's the default Postgres port? 5432? Whatever it is. It just works. It's just there. So this link is what makes the Docker, is the glue that holds the Docker containers together. This is where you get the intercontainer communication. You can map these containers to each other so that they can see each other and they can see the pieces they need and everything else is sort of sandboxed off. So this is the sort of the closest thing you get to, to Apple's you know, inter-process communication that bypasses the sandboxes. And this is what makes these tools all work together. You use things like volumes from, which simply says, take the shared volumes from this database and make them accessible. You can mount files directly from the Docker host or other containers into your container. So you can share files between each other and you can share ports, you can share network pieces, you can share access to their containers. So your containers can talk to each other in any way that you want to construct. So you have pretty, pretty granular control over the ways your, your containers are interacting with each other. So from the outside world, what's, do you have to do anything security-wise? Let's say you do an install on a client site and you have, say, your app, you containerize it, you've got four containers, you've got an application server, you've got a web client, you've got something sure. else, and you've got database, right? How, from the outside world, uh, outside being outside of the Docker, do you have to do anything special to secure that? No, not really. I mean, so the, the same general rules apply for securing the host as it would with any other host. Uh, if the Docker host is compromised, you have problems regardless. Not, there's really no magic that's going to save you from that. If a single container has a problem, though, you have a little bit more flexibility because that container can't really see outside of itself. You can only ever see what, what the container is allowed to access. It's a sandbox. And so the idea is that should any one of your containers have a problem, you can just kill it, nuke it, spin up another one with almost no resource cost of doing so. And by spinning up a new container, you sort of go back to your default state that you want it to start in. And so either by using, uh, as Oliver mentioned, committing off of a previous layer or committing off of a previous linked clone, or just saying, all right, start from zero, go back to the basic Docker image for this container, start from there, and build up. And so... You can, like I said, you can collapse and create these new containers on demand willy-nilly with almost no overhead cost. So there's very little to be concerned about in terms of individual machines overall destroying the whole. That being said, security is an ongoing issue. If you look on Docker's GitHub issues page, it's horrifying. Don't do that. Um, it's a concern that people are, you know, that people are talking about, and there's ways to sort of mitigate the issues there. Um, the Docker daemon does run through a TLS connection, so you know, inside of itself. Docker containers communicate in a secure channel. But again, your entire structure is only as good as its weakest endpoint. Same rules that generally apply. You know, that's true for any, any of them. I had a question. Um, so in the little bit that I've done with Docker so far, one of the most mysterious elements of it, and this sort of plays into what we were just talking about, is the storage of data in containers. You store, you create service containers, and you create data containers, but I've yet to see like a real world example of why it would be valuable for you to store your data in a container, other than portability sake. I mean, sure. there's the backup element of it, and I'm just sort of wondering what, is, what your process is. What does your rig actually, actually look like? You spin up a Linux VM, and then you launch Docker, and then you put all your data in containers? Sure, okay, so, your, okay, so think, think about it this way, right? You want to serve Monkey. Your monkey repo has to go somewhere on disk. 
You can't avoid that. You've got to have somewhere that has your manifest, packages, catalogs, et cetera, folders. They have to go somewhere. If you run that directly onto the host, those files are on the host. You have to figure out how to back them up by backing up that host that holds them, or you, know, you put them in some other file storage somewhere. They have to go somewhere. So the data container offers you a couple options. First off, as you mentioned, portability is a big one. The second one is that the data container is a sandbox for your data, and you can easily hook up your data container to other backup services. One of the things that I do for all of mine, for example, is I hook up all of these to an rsync container, which rsyncs them to my, my network file backup. Um, that's really trivial, right? It's real simple, because all I have to do is just hook up an rsync container that says, take this folder that's being shared to me, send it all across to my backup, we're good to go. And I can do it with all my individual containers that run data. And these data containers, the reason for using this approach is that, first off, these files are not limited or dependent upon the file system structure of my Docker host. Because if I, if I assume, let's say I'm storing all of my monkey data in uh, opt slash monkey on the Docker host, and I spin up all of my monkey containers to use that, that file storage there. If I ever do this on a different server, I have to change that if I'm not using the exact same file structure. At that, at that point, that means I'm now depending upon the layout of the file system of the original Docker host to determine the, the, how it's going to be for all the other servers around that. I don't want to do that. I want to maintain that portability. I want to maintain the ability to be completely agnostic of the platform. And one of the ways you can do that is by abstracting out the host file system completely. You just say, oh, it's inside this container. I'll ship this container that has my data whenever I need to move it around. I can back up this data. I can manipulate this data. I can access it from any other container that I want. It's always going to be there, and it's still on disk somewhere. It's just inside the, the Docker infrastructure. But it's still there. So I think you don't lose anything by using this approach. And instead, I think you gain a little bit of flexibility. You gain some portability. And you gain the ability to, to manage it in ways you couldn't necessarily do without Docker. I think that was an excellent answer. I think it's the best answer I've ever heard on why to store your data in, can in a container, actually. But doesn't it freak you out a little? I mean, seriously. You know what? You're like, okay, you're used to having files on disk and, yeah. you know, database for, you know, on disk, and then all of a sudden you put it in this thing called a container, and you're like, where does it actually live? I know it's in this little, you know, Linux container yeah. file system. It helps them like sacrifice a goat first. Yeah. That, that usually fixes all okay. the problems right there ahead of time. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of using data containers. Um, because I think that, for one thing, I think it clarifies from a visual sense what's actually happening in the structure here. So if we go back to this picture right here, all right, if you imagine every single one of these containers is, just has a little tiny duplicate that's just its data container off to the side, it actually becomes really easy now to think about what the state of your containers are. The idea is that if you kill off your monkey container right now, your data still persists. It doesn't matter what host you're on. That data is still there in a separate container. You can spin up new monkey containers without ever losing your data. One of the things you have to think about with Docker is just be mindful of the state of all your services at any given time. When you kill a Docker container, any data inside that container that is not saved or preserved somewhere else is lost, right? It's like, it's like making a VM and then deleting it. If you don't preserve that data, it's gone. So when you think about making these Docker containers fit together, you've got to think about the state of where all your stuff is. So by, by abstracting it out of your, by, by turning your containers into services versus storage, to me that makes total sense. You have, a lot of you probably have a server that's dedicated to network file storage. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's happening. Um, so, you know, if you, if you, you know, you have, you've got a server, like, you know, a SAN or an NAS that's running your, just your storage. All it does is it just sits there for your network storage. You've got your other services that run your servers. You've got your web services that access your storage to get their data. That same general rule is just sort of scaled down into a Docker format. You've got your Postgres container that runs Postgres, but it's actual data stored in a separate container somewhere else. If something happens to this Something happens to this Postgres container, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. The data is somewhere else. And it's not tied to the host. It's not tied to where it's from. It doesn't depend on any specific file structure. All I have to say is use this data container, and it's there. And so I can move these data containers around. I can play with them as much as I want, and they're always going to be there. And every time I say Postgres access a data container that's named Postgres data, no matter what host I put these two things on, it's going to work. Portability. Last question. Stop asking him questions. Sorry. Stop it. 
Um, how much of a black box is a container in the sense of if the container gets borked, you know, like OD does, um, can you still get access to your data somehow or is is essentially is, is still a flat file and you can get access to the data no matter what happens to the Docker container itself? I'm now inside my container. It's a tiny Linux VM. No, seriously. What this just says is open up a terminal running bash in this container that's currently running Sal. And if you want to, you can look around all the things inside your container. And so it's not really a black box. It's just its own little tiny, tiny sandbox that happens to have a full-fledged, you know, a little tiny OS in there. And so if you want to start playing with things inside this container, you can. You can navigate to any of these. You can say, oh, what's this run.sh file? Oh, that's the thing that Sal uses to, to start up all of its services, right? So it's, it's not a black box. It's just it's a, it's a little tiny Linux sandbox. You can manipulate it just like any other Linux sandbox. It's just not everything is there. If the OS of that sandbox gets borked, do you still have access to those files well, I so mean, that file system. Yeah, it's on the file system still, and so as long as your file system is still intact, you can still access your your, your data. Well, I think that also speaks to the layers. There's layers of how that Docker container was built, where it took a Ubuntu or other type of Linux flavor and then built on top of that, okay, what do I need to do to prepare Django and everything else for this particular container? Uh, so if you made a, a, if it got borked, it got borked and there's a snapshot in time that you can go back to for that specific container if you want to roll back time. Yeah, thanks. I guess my comparison was a Hyper-V virtual machine, for example, that goes bad and you can't even mount it to get access to the data, period. Right, well, I mean, if, you're, if your Docker host is borked, it's borked. I mean. Docker is not going to solve problems with if your entire, you know, the entire host goes away. Um, that being said, like I said, being mindful of state is the important thing. That's why I like using data containers because that way it doesn't really matter what happens to my services. If the services containers themselves get messed up in some way, the data isn't there. I don't have to worry about that going away if I kill or nuke that container. And so as long, you know, as long as you're mindful of where you're actually keeping storage versus service, it's actually really easy to make sure that problem never becomes an issue for you which is one of the approaches I like around Docker. All right, so I'm out of time. One last statement, okay? It's complicated. There's a lot of documentation out there. It's nutty. I know it is. I know this is kind of a, a long info dump talk, and I'm sorry for that, and I was also had too many cups of tea. I'm too excited. But I think it's really easy to play with, and it's a really easy way to get introduced to new services if you haven't played with them yet. Always want to set up your own puppet server, your own chef server, your own monkey server. If you haven't had a chance to do it, this is an easy way of doing it. I think. Go out and play with it. Good luck. Thank you, Nick.